Right. This is um, a, a, a project that I've been um, uh, discussing with many people uh, at uh, Flatiron and also um, in Stuttgart and in Sissa uh, um, and in uh, uh, Nuremberg. But the main players uh, have been uh, uh, my PhD student Niklas and my postdoc uh, uh, Lorenzo, uh, especially for the first part. And the second part in which I'm going to be discussing the uh, slave rotor um, uh, results, uh, uh, there we have been profiting from the insight by Daniele uh, Guerci. So these papers have been, um, the, 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 the initial communication just came out and the other one, we are about to post it on archive. So let me try to um, start from a, a, big, a bit of a general motivation. Um, so how we classify topological band structures. And for that, we use symmetries. And uh, for instance, if we start from uh, uh, the simplest uh, uh, absence of uh, time reversal and uh, particle load symmetry, like churn insulator, you see um, in this two orbital subspace uh, denoted by this vector D, where we uh, I can write this Hamiltonian, um, that I can... Uh, um, distinguish between uh, the case in which the D vector, which essentially points from the blue to the red orbital, uh, winds uh, around uh, the old unit sphere, or uh, only incompletely does that. And so that's a topological phase transition and the churn number changes. If I add a time reversal symmetry and consider two copies of that, I have uh, a quantum spinol insulator, and this uh, 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 this transition can be obtained only uh, by closing and reopening the gap. Um, so this uh, classification gives us information about the metallic uh, boundary states, the, the gapless boundary states, and uh, is based entirely, as you see, on single particle eigenfunctions. Um, attempts to um, include interactions in this picture have been done um, in single side DMFT in the framework of the so-called topological Hamiltonian, which however is limited by the fact that the self-energy is K-independent, of course, uh, in single side DMFT. And uh, uh, there have been recently more uh, sophisticated constructions based on two particle symmetry indicators that however are uh, quite uh, uh, complicated to uh, to handle. So in this talk, what I'm going to do is to try to go, let's say, on the other side in the uh, mod phase uh, where we have a large U gap, but still keeping uh, a simple description. And essentially, I'm going to uh, ask the question, what survives of this classification in mod insulators where we have lost completely uh, the the the, the, the the knowledge of single particle um, as later determinants as eigenf eigenfunctions. So the, que the main question is, is um, the topology still encoded in the single particle Green's function G? And uh, uh, for that, we can already use the um, extension of the winding number proposed by Volovic uh, and Sergeant Tsang and Gurari also, uh, where uh, the symmetry between the Green's function and its inverse is already manifest. Uh, you see this, this uh, uh, object here, uh, some higher dimensional extension of that uh, are uh, integers, are winding numbers, so they cannot change uh, if you make smooth deformation of the Green's function and uh, um, extend to uh, interacting cases uh, um, uh, the topological invariants. And you see that obviously the, the Green's function here, the, the poles can change this number, but also the zeros. And for that, you need obviously a, um, a momentum de dependence of the zeros, namely uh, something that goes beyond the MFT because is uh, uh, associated to a momentum dependence of the self energy. So <clears throat> um, a back of the envelope, um, uh, Green's function for calculation for the atomic limit shows that you have a, a spectral function made of two poles, 
like this, and uh, the self energy that is associated to this uh, has to diverge as one over omega. So if um, we think that, uh, uh, so it's essentially we associate associate the mod gap with poles of, of the self energy um, differently from uh, band insulators in which uh, there is no self energy and so there cannot be a zero of the determinant of the Green's function, more generally speaking, but only at zero of uh, some diagonal elements of the Green's function. So I'm gonna show in the rest of the talk, essentially determinants of Green's function that are good ways of showing poles of the self energy. Um, and the, um, uh, the um, uh, assumption that I'm gonna do now is essentially that this single pole of the self energy of the atomic limit remains even in the, uh, if we go away from the atomic limit, but we stay with a large hard gap, remains an isolated pole. And since there is uh, um, no imaginary part of the Green's function in the gap, uh, there cannot be an imaginary part of the uh, self energy as well. And so the chance that this remains an isolated pole is uh, uh, reasonable, let's say. Um, and so we can write uh, the, the Green's function as uh, a sum of two poles, obviously now momentum dependent. And if we recast this in the terms of the self energy, essentially we end up uh, with the self energy that we can expand in T over U. And the claim uh, that I'm going to make is that an expansion in T over U yields for this self energy a form that looks like this, uh, in which you have uh, the denominator a uh, momentum dependent uh, uh, dispersion, which is exactly the non interacting one, but with renormalized parameters. Now, here I have made two assumptions. The first one is this two pole approximation, and the, the second one is this T over U uh, expansion. Both we are going to uh, sort of test and extend in these two ongoing projects. Uh, which I would like to mention. The one, one is uh, with Thomas and Mario uh, using the uh, composite operator mo uh, method uh, introduced by Adolfo Avella, which gives a systematic way of going beyond also the tuple approximation and check what happens uh, uh, to this isolated uh, zero of the Green's function beyond that. And the second one is um, a um, nice physical interpretation of this form based on the D3LEX uh, by Xenia and uh, Mary. So now I'm going to use essentially this self energy that you see here um, to show uh, the consequences of that. But before we do that, let me just justify a bit with why we get this H0 tilde, that is my uh, way of denoting the, the renormalization of the parameters. And this is quite transparent if we make a one over omega expansion of the self energy. So by doing this from the beginning with an, for instance, starting from an upper model, uh, you get um, an expansion that at the second order in one over omega contains uh, something that is essentially a um, uh, four point function with different sites, L and J are different sites and uh, convoluted, uh, let's say, uh, summed uh, uh, with uh, the original dispersion. And uh, this um, sum over Q essentially selects uh, from the uh, non-interacting dispersion the proper hopping um, uh, bonds that uh, go into the renormalization in the form of some correlation function, for instance, some W occupancy uh, involving the two sites uh, where you are considering the hopping. That's how you build this H0 tilde that resumming gives you uh, the denominator that I was talking uh, about before. This has been already introduced in uh, other papers, uh, one by Achim Roche uh, by, by solving uh, a two orbital model that you see here, this essentially this H0 tilde popping up here, and one, a beautiful paper by uh, André Marie. Tremblay, uh, where he works out uh, the entire continued fraction here, and this would be this, the same term that I'm considering here, and the uh, lower floors of the uh, continued fraction would not contribute uh, if we make the limit T over U very uh, small. I want to mention also uh, something that is now quite uh, popular at the moment, uh, which is the Atsugai-Komoto interaction, which is a 
particularly strange interaction in terms of physics uh, because it's a uh, infinite range and uh, uh, entirely local in K, as you see here. Um, this is, however, uh, nice analytically because it allows uh, to, to get some analytic uh, results. In particular, in this case, this one floor exp expression that I have does energy would become exact. But that's just uh, because of the uh, specificity of this model. Anyway, um, the consequences of this H0 tilde um, allows us to classify MOT insulators. More uh, precisely, uh, if we call G tilde the Green's function in which we add our self-energy with the ansatz that I showed you, then the winding number of G can be shown to be the opposite of the winding number of G tilde. So essentially, we can say that uh, um, H0K, the original H0K, and H0 tilde gives us uh, the same uh, topology, so they belong to the same topo uh, symmetry class. We cannot change symmetry class with this uh, single particle description, uh, contrary, for instance, to these two particle indicators that I mentioned before. So we are restricted to remain in the same symmetry class. However, we can very easily analyze the uh, topology of a complicated non perturbative mott insulator via the dispersion of its uh, zeros. In particular, if we have a non-interacting band structure that has uh, a winding number and some gapless edge uh, modes uh, as shown here, um, we have to sort of go in the mod phase and calculate H0 tilde, and then we will have this red surface that you see here. And suppose that this, parameter, this renormalization does not uh, make the red poles, the red zero, sorry, uh, trivial, then we will have uh, gapless edge modes also in this case that, of course, are gapless edge zeros. So the bulk boundary correspondence extends also to the zeros and to this H0 tilde that, uh, that we have to calculate, but in principle is possible uh, with some uh, um, uh, numerical techniques. In some sense, we have access to so-called topological quantum chemistry, but of mod phases, but even more Interestingly, we can then study the physical meaning of the zeros that has been suggested, for instance, recently by Michele in this beautiful paper. Not only this one, there is also another one su suggesting uh, the physical properties, the physical content of the Lattinger surface and, uh, um, and its excitations. And in the second part of my talk, I'm going to uh, discuss uh, the, um, the link between H0 tilde and the spin on dispersion. So let me start to um, illustrate what happens in an exactly solvable one-dimensional chain. So I take an SSH chain like this, uh, and here we have a winding number that we can define uh, again by our from our vector d, whether or not it encloses and circles the, the the origin of the uh, of the of the plane. And uh, uh, let me uh, show this determinant that uh, is, as I said, a good way to show isolated poles. Um, this is uh, essentially resembles the spectral function. It's close to, 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 to the spectral function. It's not exactly a spectral function because it contains also the real part of G, but uh, it gives here clearly two bands in the weak uh, U, the small U limit, but a lar in a large U, it gives some hover bands here and here, and then topological zeros uh, described by our by our H0 uh, tilde. Uh, the topological invariant uh, can be calculated either fully from the Green's function or from the one number of H0. And of course, now the question is, uh, what happens if we cut the chain? This was a cluster DMFT uh, result. Now I instead do exact diagonalization of my uh, finite chain. And again, I show some something that is close to the determinant, but is spatially resolved. So these are my, now sites from 1 to 12 in my chain. And you see that I have, uh, for the uh, topological phase of this SSH model without interaction, some bulk eigenvalues, uh, 1 and 2, and uh, uh, zero energy, zeros at the ends, at the two uh, ends of the chain. Now, 
if I go to the um, interacting case, I switch it to the interacting case, then I have some bulk eigenvalues that are lower and upper upper bands essentially. And now my determinant shows nicely zero energy zeros that are in, in red here, isolated zeros, leaving at the edge so of the shades at site one and site 12. So now what I want to do is to glue these two shades together in order to let this guy here speak to the left here um, in a non-interacting chain. So I have half of the chain interacting and the left half uh, non-interacting. And what happens uh, is something interesting. Now this is from one to 12 again, but you see I have a zero energy pole at the very left, a zero energy zero at the very right, but at the center, I lost the isolated zero. So the chain um, does not have um, isolated zeros in, in the center, which uh, somehow is, uh, is uh, reasonable from the point of view of topology, because if the two systems have the same topological index, there cannot be an edge, a gapless edge state or, or boundary state in the center. However, uh, this suggests that there is a mechanism to hybridize this guy here with some low energy states uh, that is uh, close by. And this uh, can be understood even better if you go to the uh, spin uh, language, if you switch to a spin uh, language in which this uh, SSH chain essentially has a spin gap, uh, which goes as J to the, of this delta J to the two third, and uh, um, and and you see that in the non-trivial uh, case, uh, in with open boundary conditions, uh, the spin gap is zero, meaning that we have isolated spins at the edge of this SSH chain, uh, suggesting that this hybridization is nothing but uh, some kind of screening of this isolated spin with the bath coming from the uh, from the metallic part of the. Uh, so from the non-interacting part of the chain. In two dimensions, we can do the same. And uh, in classic MFT, we, we can see the inversion of the, <clears throat> of the bulk zeros uh, uh, by changing M as shown in this picture and classify again our uh, topological mott insulators uh, via H0 tilde or via the Green's functions, uh, just integrating brute force there. And uh, if we make a slab of that, the determinant again will give uh, edge uh, uh, poles uh, for u equals zero and edge zeros in the mod phase you see here, where you have upper and lower upper bands, and then <clears throat> in the center, this uh, um, uh, gapless edge zero. So now the interesting thing is to see um, what happens uh, of this uh, annihilation in two dimensions? And if we interface a conventional TI with uh, uh, edge modes like this, uh, with this new uh, topological mod insulator which, with edge zeros, uh, and then we follow a wave packet that propagates following the Green's function from this side. So I'm essentially following a wave packet that should propagate um, on the edge if there was no topological mott insulators. And from this point on, I will let instead this wave packet speak to the left, to the, to the edge zeros of the mott insulator. And essentially what I, what I see is this blue uh, Gaussian packet, that uh, package that uh, um, loses weight when uh, it can speak to the uh, zeros of the topological mott insulators which is a paradox, of course, because it seems that uh, I lose my original electron uh, when there is the possibility for it to speak to the edge zeros on the other side. So to understand this uh, kind of uh, apparent uh, loss of uh, uh, charge conservation, we uh, looked at the kane mele hubbard model and uh, solved that with the uh, slave rotor uh, methods introduced uh, by Antoine and Serge Florence. And, uh, um, and essentially here, um, we go to the, to, le, to the large M limit and uh, solve the 
uh, rotor quantum sigma model equations. And uh, in this case, we find, as already found by Stefan Rachel and Katrin Lehor, a gapped U1 spin liquid uh, in which we have uh, um, bulk spinons that are inverted and edge spinons that uh, uh, go around uh, um, our sample with instead a charge sector that is gapped. It's also similar, it's actually very, very close to what pacing and balance found in this three orbital model in which the spinons have uh, an inverted band structure in this topological MOT insulating phase that they find here uh, before magnetic ordering sets in. And so here, um, now what Niklas did uh, together with Daniele was to study this now in real space, uh, kind of in, in real space resolved uh, geometries in order to study the, the, uh, the interaction of these edge spinons uh, with uh, conventional um, uh, edge, uh, edge uh, states of, of, of TIs. And uh, this is the, the, the dispersion of the spinons, uh, the linear dispersion of the edge spinons, and the bulk you see here and here in a slab calculation. And now, Niklas suggested this nice uh, torus geometry where we can see very nicely the annihilation. So what happens is, again, we have uh, half of the system that is uh, with large U, so a, a topological MOT insulator in this sense, so this uh, gap U1 spin liquid, and on the other side, instead, the conventional TI. So now here, I will have edge, normal edge modes, and here, edge spinons. And uh, this is their spectrum. So the, the green are the TI on the TI side, you see here. And the, the blue are instead the, spin, the edge spinons here. And if I now let the two speak to each other. So these are completely decoupled. They have uh, different velocities, you see, but if they speak to each other, uh, now they can uh, annihilate like in this case. Uh, and indeed, uh, we find uh, a gapping out uh, of this edge spin. And so it's essentially kind of uh, a, um, a condo insulating, uh, condo insulator gap that opens up uh, because these spins get screened by the uh, conduction uh, uh, helical uh, boundary modes of the TI. And uh, um, of course, the, uh, this is the, what happens to the spinots. I promised I would have told you about the, the, the connection with, this, with the zeros. Uh, to, to get to the zeros, we have to uh, perform a convolution uh, between the rotor and the, and the spin on Green's function. And uh, um, and if one does that in the bulk now, for different values of the spin orbit coupling lambda, once it has a picture like this, so we have upper and lower upper bands. Now, in this uh, solution of the slave rotor, uh, the nice thing is that we have spatial fluctuations, so our uh, zeros have a dispersion, contrary to single side DMFT, so this goes beyond single side DMFT, and you see the, the red dispersion here is the uh, zeros. And uh, in the dash uh, black line, I show the spin on multiplied by factor of 10 in this case. And if I now progressively reduce lambda, so the spin orbit coupling, you see that uh, I get uh, close to a situation in which the two become gapless in the bulk at k and k prime and invert their uh, dispersion at the same lambda, which in this case is lambda equal to zero. So um, the spinons and zeros are not on top of each other in terms of the excitations, but their uh, topology is the same. And uh, um, this allows to, uh, to address or to solve, if you want, our uh, strange uh, destiny of this wave packet that was uh, showing before, now recasted in this uh, honeycomb geometry language. This would be like this, that we have a wave packet flowing here. And then when encountering the zeros on the other side, we were not sure what was going on at the interface. But if we now show uh, this in terms of this uh, charge gapped, <coughs> charge gapped uh, um, rotors on the, on the uh, MOT-TI side, where only spinons flow 
around and instead in the uh, conventional ti side we have uh, we have uh, uh, condensed uh, rotors so uh, no spin charge separation uh, then it's clear that what is going on uh, at this level here will be that the charge remains confined to the uh, to the ti side whereas the spin on goes around the whole uh, the old sample. So here we were not seeing the physical electron because essentially this uh, uh, macroscopically phase separates uh, in a way that the spinon travels further all the way around the topological mod TI, uh, the topological mod insulator, whereas the charge uh, remains here in the uh, TI side. And this is consistent with uh, the yoff larkin composition rule uh, uh, that you can work out in this case where we have um thin where, where we have a system with uh, um, spin charge separation like this because if you have uncondensed rotors so a gap then you have zero conductivity for the uh, for the boson and the conductivity from here to here is given by uh, the original uh, conductivity of the C fermions. Whereas if we now make both uh, sides uh, with condensed uh, uh, rotors, so we are essentially interfaces interfacing two TIs, then the conductivity of the of the boson becomes infinite, and we uh, and this compensate perfectly uh, because here this this disappears, and we have compensation between sigma C and sigma f, and so no edge transport as it has to be uh, in this case where we have essentially a, a conventional TI in the whole system. So um, this in some sense gives uh, uh, an answer to the puzzle that we were uh, finding in the first part where we were not considering uh, in our wave packet uh, explicitly the possibility of uh, uh, spin charge uh, uh, separation at the edge uh, and opens, of course, a number of uh, interesting questions like uh, how exactly this scattering here uh, happens and what happens to the other spin uh, copy, because here I'm all, always showing just uh, uh, the spin up sector. Of course, there is also a spin down sector. And so there is back scattering at the interface and what happens to the charge. Uh, when we add the other spin. So a number of open questions that this spin, uh, that this uh, uh, rotor, slave rotor uh, formalism has actually um, uh, shown us uh, um, in, in a beautiful uh, uh, way. So let me just uh, summarize because my time is essentially up. So that's the bulk boundary correspondence uh, for the um, bulk zeros uh, uh, that give rise to uh, gapless edge zeros in topological mod insulators. Um, we have shown this uh, annihilation between zeros and poles in some sense uh, resembling a um, condo insulator uh, mechanism and uh, um, found the spin charge separation at the interface between a conventional and a mod um, topological insulator. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Giorgio. So we're not, we are not open for questions. Uh, mm -hmm. So please, if you have a question, just raise your hand. We're gonna unmute you. You can also use the Q&A or the chat. There's a question in the Q&A. Uh, Gabriele. So Gabriele, I will unmute you so that you can ask a question yourself. Am I supposed to hear something? No, or... I don't think, uh, Gabriele. OK, so I will read the question. Uh, uh -huh. As far as I know, the original claim about the Kane and Mele Hubbard model uh, having a quantum spin liquid phase has been debated a lot. The argument being that it could just be a spurious find due to finite size effects in the original quantum Monte Carlo simulation. How much these results rely on the quantum spin liquid picture? 
Um, do we need to interpret the green function zeros as pinons? And finally, do the, sla the new slave rotor calculation give some insights on the old uh, querels? Yeah, so that, that's a very good question. So um, in, in, if you want, the what I'm showing here is, uh, um, is slave rotor uh, mean field uh, uh, result, which means that uh, I'm not considering at all the um, the, fluctuations, the fluctuations of the mean field uh, beyond that. So that I that actually this is not going to to solve that uh, uh, in terms of stability. So if you if you're if essentially this gap d one spin liquid is not stable then uh, um, beyond mean field, beyond the subtle point, then uh, um, things are, will be more complicated. So that, that is in some sense a partial. Um, it, so the slave rotor, I see the slave rotor as, as a nice way of linking the zeros of the Green's function that we have been discussing recently with the established um, understanding of spin on uh, in uh, in quantum spin liquid, so that's somehow a link that we make. They are not the same as I showed, but they have the same topology. That's the point. Yes, there are further. Thank you very much. Yeah, so uh, Michelle, you can ask a question. Uh, we'll unmute you. Oh no, I okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Thank you for the nice presentation. So I, I do have a question on the uh, SSH model. When you join the two SSH together, you sh yes, that's you going there. Um, you demonstrated that um, when they have the same topology that is interacting or not interacting, then the states interact with each other and they open a gap. I was wondering if it's a different topology, let's say on the non-interacting, uh, like demarize the other way. Do you still you know, do you form a polaron at the interface? Mm, so, so what the statement here is that if they have the same, um, if they are in the same topological class, mm -hmm. and if they have the same non-trivial uh, number, the uh, value of the of the of the invariant, then they will, uh, then they will hybridize. So I cannot answer to the uh, to the question whether you have a completely different interacting kind of uh, topological class. Imagine you form a, a completely different uh, uh, state on the on the right. Then then in some sense you don't have the same topology left and right. And in that case, I I, I would expect everything can happen. No? So this getting out, this is just a way of the system to avoid that here you have a gapless um, zero that is not allowed in this, uh, if left and right, uh, you have the same topology at the single particle level. If you are asking whether at the two particle level I can have something more complicated, then left and right can speak differently to each other, yeah. No, my, simple, my question was simpler, is that like the uh, the topology comes from the dimerizations, the, the way the dimerize. So if you switch dimerization, oh, 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 if I switch dimerization, no, no, then in that case, then I switch, I would have, I would have a Z, uh, well, in this case, it's N1 equal one and N1 equal zero. And then, then in that case, I don't see annihilation. Okay. I, I do see annihilation, however, even if I break. Um, because you might have noticed that that I show here perfect uh, particle symmetry, even though there is no need of particle symmetry in the SSH model, I still observe uh, annihilation even if I remove particle symmetry, only that it would not be as clean as here because I mismatch the two and then this annihilation becomes less visible in some sense. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we now have uh, Irakli. Hi, uh, thank you very much uh, for nice talk, Giorgio. I have one question. As I understand this results, it's kind of continuation of pre previous question was done with exact diagonalization. 
or do you think how much the finance as FX plays role and what happened if one uh, consider a larger uh, system? Yeah, so the, for the one dimensional chain, we solved that because essentially already in the first paper, uh, this is now pretty small what I show here, but Marcel Kle uh, Klet performed the Monte Carlo calculation with, a, a, as far as I remember, 48 sites or so. And there was um, every um, everything that we find at the level of ED was found also there. Uh, for the for the slave rotor calculation, we have finite sides uh, uh, effects, but in a trivial way, in some sense. Uh, um, uh, I mean, it scales uh, uh, not fantastically because we have not optimized it yet. Uh, yet, but we 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 don't have the same the same exponential growth as here um so that for the for the slave rotor part is not an issue i would say i see thank you very much thank you. Uh, perhaps uh, one question also giorgio elaborating on gabriele's uh, remark yeah. so uh, would you agree with me that uh, when we do slave rotors uh, the question of whether the model has a quantum spin liquid perhaps of you when nature uh, is a little hard to to answer because one would I mean of course the slave rotors are naturally prone to to generate such a phase right and with a spin on Fermi surface or perhaps Dirac points in this case but um, but in fact one would have to study competing magnetic states and things like that right? yeah 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 absolutely so magnetic states and also fluctuations beyond that somehow. I was already very happy to get a dispersion of the of the zeros in this model as as uh, um, it was not completely clear at the beginning to me because many other slave uh, um, formalism have flat zeros in the Green's function, uh, whereas uh, the slave brothers are particularly suited for for giving that yeah and this is because you sold the effective sigma model in finite dimensions right exactly. so you give Not, a dispersion to everything exactly it's what you call this better mean field mm -hmm. uh, kind yeah. of uh, solution exactly uh, now of course the next step would be going beyond uh, beyond that as you say and study the stability of that yeah I, I think that uh, uh, in the spin liquid community the stability of gap spin liquid is less uh, debated that uh, that the stability of gapless spin liquid but uh, that's still <laughs> yeah okay thank you uh, and yes thank you very much uh, now next we have andy that has a question now am i unmuted yes yeah great all right, sorry. Um, okay, just further to Antoine's comment. I mean, um, while it's certainly true that one may question the the accuracy of uh, this kind of mean field slave rotor approximation for determining the true ground state of the model, um, to me, it's important to, um, in Antoine's favorite phrase, separate variables a little bit. Um, I believe that the accomplishment here is drawing a link between a spin liquid ground state, which was explicitly constructed, Green's function zeros, and this interesting behavior at the edge, right? Um, yeah. And the important question on the table here is the validity of that link beyond the uh, mean field slave rotor approximation. Of course, if the ground state is different, then there may not be Green's function zeros, there may not be topology, et cetera. That's a different question. Um, so I'd like to ask the assembled multitudes, um, is there uh, a reason to be scared of the slave rotor approximation for those particular questions? That is, this constructing the edge state and how it annihilates and so on. Hmm. Oh, I mean, maybe I can make a comment on that. I think as long as we, as you mentioned, place ourselves in the framework of this of this quantum spin liquid phase, this is probably the, a, a quite economical approach that is not that is fairly reliable in the sense, provided one solves one does this improvement field that solves the rotor model in fine dimension, a finite dimension as was done. 
Yeah. Yeah, what, what Niklas here uh, together with Daniele did was this uh, um, this uh, um, finite sides kind of of uh, of solution, but um, um, yeah. the, the quantum uh, nonlinear sigma model is solved uh, uh, in finite dimension. So so that's that's how we can get this this dispersion of the zeros and. And yeah, it's still, it's still very, I think what is the, the difficult question, Andy, we discussed a couple of times is how this uh, connection, this link between the uh, zeros and the spinons survives, extends when we dope, or at least we move the chemical potential and we start to get mm. into, into the bands that, that then is, we have to work a bit more. As long as we stay in this perfectly particle symmetric situation, the, the link is very clear. Uh, but the evolution with, with chemical potential is more tricky and we have to, yeah. Well, if, if well, I may say, yeah, sorry, Giorgio, please. Yeah, no, 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 I would say it requires some more thinking than, or at least some something more than what I was showing in this talk where I didn't address this at all. Well, I think Nicholas has, I think there, if, if one is willing to uh, accept the um, spatially inhomogeneous slave rotor mean field theory, which is, you know, really Nicholas' big tech and Daniele's big technical accomplishment, um, then that question is clearly answerable. Again, the question is what goes, if anything, will go wrong with this theory on, on the qualitative level will go wrong with the theory. Yeah. And and Giorgio, so just so that I'm I understand things properly. So uh, you're saying you're getting a gapped spin liquid? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the the fully for, gapped for every well, you have the charge, the charge sector is gapped. Uh, yeah, of course, the big gap, and then you have the 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 spin on gap that is ruled by this spin orbit coupling. And so if oh, I see, I see. And now I get it. Okay. If lambda is finite, you get a, a gap at the k point, and then lambda you go to zero, you get this gapless. Okay, thank you. 